Hi, I'm Rich from the Sea Angling Adventures team. Uh, we're down at uh, Torbay Mark today doing a bit of rough ground fishing. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, show you how to hopefully save some money on your rough ground rigs whilst um, keeping the quality excellent and uh, having the assurance that you're going to land that big fish when you need to. So uh, we're down here using baits this kind of size at the moment. Um, mackerel's typically the bait of choice, scad, mullet, um, garfish do tend to take some eels as well. I've had some success on that in the past. Obviously um, when we're using baits this size, uh, hook placement is of the paramount importance which I'll show you a bit later on when we go on to um, uh, baiting up uh, a rig. But initially what I'm going to show you now is um, how I make my rigs and uh, why I think um, well, I think they're ideal for this type of fishing. Right, so I'm going to show you uh, how I set up my rigs. The, the key, as I keep saying, is to um, keep it absolutely simple. Um, you may think this looks like nothing special, but I can assure you it's taken me a long time to develop this and get happy with it. Um, essentially, quality components is the most important part to this. Um, wire, this is 150 pound black nylon coated wire. Um, don't ask me why the black, I just uh, like it, personal preference. Swivels, good quality, these, uh, these are cro Cox and Roll, good quality, uh, high breaking strain swivels, absolute must. Um, I've seen swivels snap before in snags and on eels, um, so these are the stainless steel crane swivels from Cox and Roll. Um, when you're going with the stainless steel, you can afford to go a little bit smaller because it's a hell of a lot stronger. So um, these break at 310, that's uh, more than enough for what I'm looking for. And also with it being slightly smaller, less likely to get uh, hung up behind rocks and in snags. Moving on to the hooks, Cox and Roll meat hook. Um, again, I've, I've messed around with a lot of hooks over the years. Um, these don't bend. Um, you really have to put some pressure through them to bend. I've had big 8 hooks hooks uh, snap in the past as well. The most important thing for, for me with these is they keep their edge really well. Um, one thing I talked about with Andy um, last time we were out fishing together was how important it is after every single cast when you retrieve to check your hook, check it's nice and sharp. Um, if it's not sharp, resharpen it. These keep their edge really, really well. They still do need touching up, but um, not as much as some of the others. And then uh, with the um, with the 150 pound wire, I'm using eight millimeter length, 2.4 millimeter diameter um, uh, rig sleeves crimps. Now, another important thing to mention when I'm doing this is a lot of people uh, will know that crimps do have a tendency to pull. Um, this is something that I've experienced in the past, which uh, isn't helpful, obviously. I double crimp everything. Um, Finally, I use uh, black heat shrink tubing, uh, electrical black heat shrink. Um, this goes over the crimps, which we'll see in a moment. Um, what this does is stops your bait elastic getting uh, all snarled up in the crimps, getting caught on the tag end of your wire. So first things first, we go with the wire. Now this is probably 14 inches in length. Two crimp sleeves onto your wire, like so power swivel so you pass it through the eye now what we're looking to do here is leave a bit of a loop to leave some room for the swivel to hinge freely and to move as freely as we can so we want to slide the crimp sleeves on and then leave a, a loop in the in the wire with the crimp sleeves just uh, a few millimeters apart now these are a very important tool, these are electrical crimping pliers. I find these make all the difference in ensuring that that crimp holds and that they stay. These are fairly readily available at any electrical wholesalers, DIY shop, they're not very expensive. Um, I couldn't recommend getting a pair enough. So we just crimp, there's different size settings on these, the second one back for this size but obviously check your own. After we've cr crimped once, I then turn it to 90 degrees and crimp the tag end back in again that puts it into a nice perfect little uniform uh, square almost I'd say and then with the second twist it again 90 degrees 
that's your swivel attached. Heat shrink down the line, down the wire. We'll get back to that in a minute. Obviously this end, same again. Second piece of heat shrink. This will go over your hook, where your hook attaches. Two crimp sleeves again. And uh, again, cox and roll, 8 meat hook. And same with the swivel end. We need room for that to be able to move freely on the line. Similar again. And finally, with a uh, cigarette lighter, you can use uh, the steam off a kettle for this as well. I know a lot of guys do that. We just shrink the heat shrink down. Wind's not helping me. As you can see, we're out on the rocks. Just get a good coverage all over. Well, I don't think that's gonna work. That's uh, trying to film out in the uh, in the wilds for you actually on location at a mark but you get the idea with that essentially the heat shrink comes down what that prevents is where you've got your little tag of the wire I always leave a, a small tag of wire out in case they do start to pull that just prevents anything getting caught in there your bait elastic maybe your rotten bottom if you're using a slightly longer one stops it getting caught in there 12 inches in total when finished maybe a little bit more what I tend to do is I make these up in sort of 25s 50s at a time so I cut everything to set lengths all of the heat shrink the wire get everything out ready and get a little production line going on and um, that's my rig uh, I know a lot of guys like to use panels um, to my mind that's just the second hook to get stuck in a snag um, in case you haven't noticed I really don't like getting stuck in snags, so um, I don't miss many fish on this. I certainly don't lose many fish on this, um, and that's the rig that I'm confident using. Right, so what I'm gonna do is uh, show you how I bait up for an eel. Um, this isn't the biggest bait I'd ever put out, in truth, I, I do really like big baits, but there is a chance of a huss here, so we're, we're gonna go slightly smaller than usual. So, take your mackerel, tail off, Now, head off, just maybe half an inch, three quarters of an inch forward of the gill plate, cut that right through. What you can see straight away, no different than you do for a sand eel, with a sand eel off the, uh, off the beaches for a ray, you're letting all that lovely juice and blood out of the fish. That really does make a difference. Somebody taught me that a long time ago and it upped my catch rate straight away. We get a rook. What I do is I just pass it through, just nick it through the tail like so, pull that clean through. Then I just nick it under the skin, push the hook down, pull it through like so. Hook point nice and exposed. We get a bait elastic, start at near the bottom. Now this unfortunately is a frozen mackerel, I'd have preferred fresh so they are a bit soft. Work your way up, pay particular attention around the crimps and the eye of the hook, this stops it slipping. All the way up. And then we go right up near the tail end. You don't need to go up too far, it will sit where it is. Work our way back down, snap off. Now, as you can see there, that hook point has got to be totally exposed. That will not now lie nice and streamlined, it won't spin up in the tide. Don't be afraid of big baits, you'll still catch the huss on, on a bait this size. In fact, I've taken more specimen huss on larger baits than I have smaller. They're, they're quite determined fish and they will take it um, and essentially just hit them quick. You'll miss the odd fish, it happens, but I've caught loads of big huss on that bait as well. You can also add some squid to this if you like, that's also popular with the huss. Um, you take a few eels on it as well. 
Um, and, and I use this technique for scad, uh, for garfish. I use big long chunks of garfish as well. Um, scad's another video. There is a, a quite a specific way that I prepare those as well. Um, some people might think it looks a bit funny or a bit overkill, but I can guarantee it's up to my catch rate. So. Uh, the other thing I wanted to show you guys, obviously just to, to finish the rig off, is uh, how I fish my rotten bottom. Um, as we said before, uh, I like a running ledger, it means that the fish can take off freely, uh, it won't feel any resistance when it gets to the uh, end of the limit of the pulley rig. Um, obviously safety is a big consideration, sometimes we are still trying to put a bait at distance um, and I'm only using 20 pound line to uh, connect the lead. So what I use, I don't know if you can see this on the camera very well, is these little um, little lead clips I call them. They're just a, a little hook there that I attach to a swivel. They don't come with a swivel, I attach, attach one on. Tie the mono up onto the swivel, obviously to the lead, and then you simply just hook the lead onto the hook, like so, and the whole lot can get sent out. Um, obviously as soon as it hits the water that will release, um, the swivel doesn't have to be particularly big, it's not there for any sort of strength, um, but that ensures you can safely cast that rotten bottom rig out uh, without risking losing your lead or doing anybody any damage. Um, the other thing I just wanted to show you as well was, with what I was saying earlier, just the little sharpening stone. They cost about 99p. This is essential, it's probably one of the most essential pieces of kit I bring, just for redressing the hooks. It doesn't matter how good quality your hooks are, we're fishing in horrible stuff here. Um, just redress the hooks after every throw and uh, ultimately that'll ensure that you're getting that fish um, every time that you get a bite. Mm -hmm.